is a presentation of Fox Sports. We are Fox Sports. We are Minnesota. the Twins final series before most of baseball takes a break and it all starts tonight against the Orioles at Target Field. Jose Brios' last start was really the only hiccup so far in his stellar sophomore campaign. He'll go for his eighth win tonight as Baltimore counters with right-hander Dylan Bundy. Twins baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by State Farm. Welcome to a perfect night for baseball at Target Field, everybody. I'm Audra Martin. The Minnesota Twins have a great opportunity to head into the All-Star break on a high note as they take on the Baltimore Orioles, who have struggled a bit, losing five of their last six contests. Here's what you need to know about this weekend series with the O's. So far this homestand, the Twins have gotten solid outings from all three starting pitchers with Aldoberto Mejia, Kyle Gibson, and Irvin Santana all pitching into the seventh and combining for just seven earned runs. And when it comes to offense, it's been Byron Buxton who stepped things up with five hits over his last two games. Tonight, he'll go for three straight multi-hit games for the first time this season. The Orioles, however, come to Target Field in search of consistency. They're one of the stronger home teams in the league, but they have the fourth lowest road winning percentage in all of baseball. They'll try to bounce back after being swept this week in Milwaukee. Coming up, it's Bundy versus Burrios. Dick Bramer and Roy Smalley will break down tonight's series opening matchup. That's all coming your way next, right here on Fox Sports North. Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Toyota. Tested, trusted Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. By CenturyLink, connecting you to the power of the digital world. And by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine for the everyday competitor in all of us. 
We're in Minneapolis. It's hot and steamy, and it's the first of a four-game series between the Twins and the Orioles. And of course, after the four games, it's the All-Star break and game. Jonathan Scope representing the Baltimore Orioles will be in Miami. And of course, Miguel Sano representing the Twins will be there for his first All-Star game. And we welcome you to Target Field, Dick Raymer, Roy Smalley for this four game series against the Baltimore Orioles, a team that the Twins swept in Baltimore in a three game series. They're handing the ball to Jose Barrios. Now, so far in July, the starting pitching for the Twins has been really encouraging, with the exception being Barrios' start in Kansas City. I think the story of tonight's game for Twins fans, for all of us, and maybe the rest of the year, is going to be how does Jose Barrios bounce back? How does he react? to having a bad start his last time out when his mechanics were messed up. We have seen him in the past the first two stints in the big leagues not react well to adversity this year. He's been very very good getting himself out of trouble. But after a bad outing how does he bounce back and get his mechanics back on track. That's what we're watching tonight. And it will help that he'll be pitching in his home ballpark where he's been very very good. Twins won the series against the Angels. They'd like to win the series against the Orioles and build some momentum forward into the All-Star break and beyond. It's a hot and muggy night. So knows ready to swing the bat as the Twins and Orioles get this four-gamer underway. This is back and deep and gone. A home run. And Urban Santana has twirled a two hit shutout in Baltimore. This team has been very fun to watch. And it is gone. A home run for Brian Dozier. As the Twins are in position to sweep the Orioles, got him looking. And he had no chance. No. Check swing, got him. And the Twins sweep the Orioles. Jose Barrios taking the mound to get this four gamer started. Barrios in his last start was given an early five to one lead, but he was beaten up by the Royals a little bit. The home run ball bit him. Ended up leaving uh, the ball game in a tie game. And then the uh, Royals went to work on the Twins' bullpen. Ended up taking three out of four from the Twins, and they haven't slowed down since. They went to Seattle and swept the Mariners and are find themselves now between the Indians and the Twins in the American League Central standings. Buck Showalter three time manager of the year winner in his eighth year with the Orioles and he has seen his team really struggle since the Twins went to Baltimore and swept them back in May. 
four games below the 500 mark. Here's the Menards batting order, and they've had some injuries to boot. Seth Smith is in right field. Manny Machado hitting second, playing third. Jonathan Scope, the Baltimore All Star. Adam Jones, Mark Trumbo. Trey Mancini's in at first base. Chris Davis is on the disabled list. Wellington Castillo catching. Young Su Kim in left. And Paul Yanish, the shortstop for the injured J.J. Hardy. Jose Barrios on the mound for the Minnesota Twins. As we mentioned in the open of the show, we'll see if he has been able to get his mechanics back on track, get his arm angle back. If that's the case, that stuff really plays up here and will he be tough on this Oriole club. Twins out in the field have a little bit of a different look. It's the same look as last night, just different from what we're accustomed to seeing. Rosario Buxton Kepler in the outfield no changes there Escobar in a third because Sano's over at first base because Joe Maurer is not in the lineup again with a bad back Polanco and Dozier up the middle and Castro will do the catch. Seth Smith to lead things off against Barrios and a first pitch strike. There is Sano at first base. Outside one and one. One thing that I think will be interesting for uh, Twins fans and viewers to uh, watch with Barrios tonight will be where his left shoulder uh, is in his delivery. In the windup, he tends to be really, really good mechanically. He keeps the front shoulder in, pointing at the plate. When he gets into the stretch, he has a tendency to fly open just a little bit. What ball players and pitchers call, pitching coaches call flying open. Where Left shoulder goes toward first base a little bit early as arm lags. Tim Laudner talked about that in the uh, in our pregame show. Neil Allen talked about it with Audra Martin. High fly to right field. Kepler, Buxton, who wants it? Kepler with the catch, one down. And that'll bring up Manny Machado on his 25th birthday. Seems like he's been around for eight years but today just his 25th birthday. Well he's some kind of player and he's absolutely uh, just cream the, the uh, twins. When we see him it seems like he, everything he hits is uh, on a line somewhere and oftentimes long somewhere. Really really good player struggling at uh, batting average uh, this year but still hitting home runs driving in runs and really picking it at third base. Strike one. Machado's average down the power still there the defense still there wide and it's one and one I mentioned the Orioles have struggled since the twins swept them in Baltimore on May 24th they've gone 15 and 24 since then and as we showed you earlier have really struggled away from Camden Yards that fouled and it's one and two. 96 miles per hour. We don't yeah, see Barrios dial it up that fast very often. Not that not that fast this early in the in the game. You're right. We can see him reach back for it 95 96 when he wants to strike somebody out with a fastball. But uh, he's feeling it tonight so far. That was 95 up and in a little bit. Two see, and two. That pitch right there is so effective it, it, it because it's 95 up around uh, the eyeballs. It, it, Inside where a hitter has to be quick, it's uh, more impressive because it's near his near his eyes where he can really see the speed, and it really sets up a breaking ball here. If Brios can throw a good breaking ball, he'll get it. Instead, it's a fastball at 96 fouled away. Two pitches ago, it was a pitch that was up and in that was effective without getting anybody upset, right? I mean, right, and you have to be able to pitch inside. I mean, you absolutely have to be. I think hitters are. In this day and age, are a little bit oversensitive to, to uh, balls that are close to him, but the pitcher has got to be able to pitch inside. There's the breaking ball, and Machado doesn't bite. Full count. Scope on deck. Orioles coming to Minnesota after being swept in Milwaukee by the Brewers in a three game series. Cracked his bat. Escobar shuffles his feet, throws to Sano, two down. 
Fly ball out, ground ball out, and a good start for Barrios. He had a good start going in Kansas City. And I think everybody felt good about handing him a five to one lead. But then the guys in the bottom of the order start banging the ball over the fence, and before he knew it, it was five five. Still a lot to learn for Jose Brios as good as he is and as good as he has been so far the learning process for a young pitcher even with this kind of stuff is is not over yet by by any means and there's going to be some adversity and some situations from which he learns all all during this season good fastball on the outside corner again at 96 well during that telecast after he was taken out uh, you could see the steam coming out of his ears he had been taken out of the game he had given up the lead and we had an extended look with, with Neil Allen talking to him and you could tell he, he was not a happy camper and I'm sure he's been waiting to get back on the mound ever since one and one missing inside two and one When Jose Barrios has his really good stuff and command of the strike zone with all three pitches, he's darn near unhittable. It's just very, very difficult to put the ball in play well against three pitches of that caliber right there when he's throwing that hard, when he's breaking balls in a good spot. We saw the breaking ball to Machado. He could have struck him out, but it, it just wasn't quite in the right spot. This fastball is on the corner, up and away at 96. Consistently 96 in this first inning. But when the, the, the whole thing about young pitchers is you're not going to have your best stuff and your best command at the same time all the time. So how do you pitch. How are you able to pitch when your curveball is not exactly where you want it your fastball you're not exactly uh, the life that you're used to you're not getting your change up over whatever it is. Can you figure out a way to uh, get hitters out then. Nice. Relying almost exclusively on that 96 mile per hour fastball. It's been the 18th pitch of the inning. Well, he knows he has a good fastball uh, tonight. There's no question about it. And uh, when you know you, when a pitcher knows he's throwing the ball well, there's a lot of life in that fastball. He's going to make them prove they can hit it. There's the breaking ball, and ultimately, Scope had no chance. No chance. When he, <laughs> 96 up in the strike zone like that, and then drop off that. Yellow hammer, that is no chance. Here One, it comes two, right three. here. Bang. Two to one loss to the Angels was a really tough one for him to swallow. He took accountability for it for the Angels getting the go ahead run on the delayed double steal. So we'll see what happens tonight. Sending out the same lineup that uh, Paul sent out yesterday. The Menard batting order has Dozier, Grossman, and Sano, Kepler, Escobar, Rosario, Polanco, Castro, and Buxton. And they'll be facing. The best the Orioles can offer in terms of a starting pitcher, right-hander Dylan Bundy. 
Well, Bundy started the season really, really well. Has struggled a little bit of late, but he's a uh, he's a tough competitor. Dozier on the first pitch bounces one to short. Easy play for Giannis. One down. Bundy likes to, he'll throw a lot of strikes. He challenges the strike zone. He has a, a nice little sinker at times. A good breaking ball and a change. A very good changeup. Orioles out of the field. Had to patch some holes. Kim is in left. Jones in center. Smith in right. Mancini normally an outfielder playing first base. Scope and Giannis in middle infield. Machado at third. Wellington to steal behind the play. One down and now Robbie Grossman. And a first pitch strike. Grossman, the designated hitter. Speed pitch over for strike two. There's that slow breaking ball. As I said, he's got a fastball, a straight one, and then he'll try to sink one. He's got a real slow curveball there. Throws a little bit different trajectory breaking ball and a changeup. So he's got a lot of pitches, a lot of weapons. 92 up and away. And 92 is about what you're going to get, but he'll move the ball around the strike zone. And you see right there, he's got that little tail. The ball moves left to right from our center field camera. Slow pitch, 73 miles per hour, left it up a little bit high, two and two. I was talking with Jim Palmer, Hall of Famer Jim Palmer, who's on the broadcast team with the Orioles. Talking with him around the batting cage before the game. It's always fun to talk with with Jim and, and he he said he loves Dylan Bundy because he said, you know, he's accountable. He just is a, a self-evaluator and asked why he hadn't been pitching as well. He said, Well, you know, up here when you throw a lot of balls in the middle of the plate, these guys seem to whack them pretty pretty well. And he's not making any excuses. He's one of those guys that knows how to pitch and just sometimes it doesn't go where he wants it to go. On the outside that corner. Up. Yeah, that's a little change up with a little tail there. Robbie didn't like it. And with two gone, bases empty. Here comes Miguel Sano. We'll see the last pitch starts out on the corner and then breaks outside. Looks like Robbie's Robbie's right about that one. I still maintain it's almost impossible for umpires to have anything more than a guess on the outside corner. Just because really, of where they're lined they, up. Yeah, they line they line up on the inside shoulder of the uh, catcher next to the hitter. I just don't think they have a re have a really good idea of the outside. Here's Sano. And a fastball strike one. Sano had a particularly frustrating ball game last night because he struck out three times in his first three at bats against Parker Bridwell. On uh, pitches like that. Off speed pitches right over the middle of the plate. Now, normally we see Sano cream those, but he didn't last night and he missed the first one here tonight. Bill Welke behind the plate. The base umpires, Reynolds, Barber, and Barrett, will all have a shot at plate duty in this four game series. Foul tip. And Castillo hangs on. And Bundy breezes through the first inning. Each starter with a 1 2 3 first inning.
baseball game. It's time for our Car Soup scoop from the clubhouse. Paul Molitor had a meeting with the team to stress the importance of staying focused on baseball this weekend, reminding the guys that they'll enjoy their break a lot more if they go into it with some wins in their pockets. On the injury front, Joe Maurer still day to day with a sore back, but he hasn't been ruled out to appear at some point this series. And there was no structural damage on Hector Santiago's MRI, just some inflammation. And when it comes to base running, well, it was a deciding factor last night. Paul Molitor says he's trying to get some of his guys to get over their fear of failure. Yes, they've made big improvements from last season, but that aggressiveness is the next step they need to take. Guys. Well, thank you, Otter. Big swing and a miss on a breaking ball to Adam Jones. I think Paul probably over time would like to, you know, have uh, his players use his hole. Ball chopped left side. And so no drops the ball. Jones will reach. Uh, so knows error. Throw was low, but on the fly, and so no should have caught it. The leadoff man is on. I've seen that with first basemen, uh, especially guys that are uh, just learning the uh, the position. Escobar throws it low, but the ball carries really well. Escobar's got a good arm, and it hits ball. It hits the Sano right in the heel of the glove. Typically, a first base will reach out and uh, think it's going to be in the webbing. The ball carries more. They get a little bit lackadaisical with their uh, focus into the glove, and the ball will carry just three inches higher than they think it's going to, and, and hit him right in the heel. Designated hitter Mark Trumbo taking ball one. Which is not an excuse. You got to catch that ball. Right, right. <laughs> Side down two and oh. Just to finish the thought, I think Paul would like to have his team to use his full playbook, if you will, to use a football term. I think down the road, as some of these guys get a little more experience, you'll see the Twins try that delayed double steal. The one that the Angels used for the deciding run last night. Well, you know, one thing that made that uh, play an awful lot easier for manager Mike Socia to call, you've got a blazer uh, on third, and right. Cameron Mabin, and, and a veteran, and not only can he run, but he's a veteran. And he knows how to, he knows what his speed is, and he knows how to run that play. 2 0 to Trumbo. To the backstop. And they got a chance at second base, but the throw goes into center field. But Karam came right back to Castro. And an on target throw would have got Jones, and instead he will reach on a wild pitch. Rios is out there, and Jones should have been retired twice, and instead he's standing at second base. Watch the front shoulder of Barrios come flying open, and that's where one of two things would happen. And you see just a little bit of a hurried play by Castro if he had taken just a little bit longer and made a good throw. Dix Wright he would have uh, he would have gotten Jones to second base. But high fly to center. Buxton going back, still going back now at the wall, turning around, hitting the top of the wall apparently, and gone for a home run. Well, Trumbo cranks one out, his 13th of the year. And a look from here as if that ball hit the very top of the wall, and then Karam to the batter's eye. Are big and strong like Sano and Trumbull. The ball just keeps on carrying. Well, he got a lot of backspin on this one. You see it, the, the kind of a down swing and a pitch that's already down and then hit the, uh, below center. And you're right, when a guy's big and strong and get the ball carrying, backspinning like that, right now the ball is really carrying in most ballparks with the hot weather, but that in this one in particular. Yeah, I guess it just cleared the wall had Buxton gotten to the right spot. Likely wouldn't have been able to catch it anyway. Now Trey Mancini taking ball one. The Orioles take full advantage of the error. Follow it with a home run. Now this one is in play. Buxton moving laterally. One down. Well, the Orioles are taking full advantage of uh, not only the error, but also just a little bit of uncertainty on the part of Barrios. And this is what we were talking about um, earlier. His mechanics are off. He throws a ball to the screen and then trying to, okay, I got to get back in the strike zone and throws a fastball right down the middle. 
and that was the uh, part of the learning process that I was talking about earlier is is OK what guys are going to be first pitch first ball swingers first fastball they see they're going to be ready to uh, really really tee off on it what do I have to mix into certain guys and even when you have good stuff when you get behind and then and then throw kind of a get me over fastball just to get back in the strike zone these guys are going to be ready to hit one strike to Castillo. I don't think anybody in the ballpark was surprised that Trumbo swung on three and oh he's built a reputation as a power hitter and delivered two nothing Baltimore one and one to Castillo no, two and one so far Jose struggling just a little bit with his breaking ball when we've seen him untouchable that breaking ball is is uh, located an awful lot like uh, Irvin Santana's slider out there on the outside corner of the right handers. No weak pop up near third. Escobar in foul ground. Makes the catch two down. That'll bring up Young Su Kim. When Barrios pitched in Baltimore against the Orioles, he got the win, gave up three runs, and they were all on. Solo home runs. And so he's touched here for a two run home run of the second inning. JJ Hardy, Chris Davis, and Jonathan Scope get home runs. And a fastball for a strike. You know, I laugh at the uh, expression that. Uh, Solo home runs won't beat you because actually, in fact, they can uh, beat you. Uh, you give up enough. <laughs> <laughs> or if you give up the one like to uh, Cole Calhoun yesterday, right. a home run and a double steal, and you lose a game two to one. But the point is the right one. It's it, you keep guys off base via the walk, and you keep throwing uh, your best stuff for strikes. And big league hitters are going to hit some home runs every once in a while. It's just the way it's going to be. So you have to uh, tip your hat and just keep throwing your good stuff for strikes and hitters won't be able to put enough hits together to to beat you. So if it, it in that sense that term and that phrase or that that sentiment is really really correct. Home, solo home runs won't beat you well over the course of the season. That's that's pretty much the case. You, 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 the alternative to not throwing strikes is not the right not the right answer. One and two to Kim. And a call third strike. Breaking ball clipping the corner. Inning started with a Sano error, and the Orioles capitalized to take a 2 nothing lead. A fielding error by Miguel Sano dropped the throw from Eduardo Escobar. And then Barrios and Castro had a little chat. And 
Reels was flustered by the air or not. He fell behind Trumbo and then came in with a strike and the results almost predictable. Two to nothing. And now here's Max Kepler. Strike on the outside corner. I like watching that little exchange between Barrios and, and Castro. Where Barrios pointed to his chest, I guess that's my fault. And Castro kind of motion, let the ball go. You know, three and oh, it's going to be swinging. Let it go. Don't just throw that. Get me over fastball. And uh, it's uh, that was uh, that was good to watch. It, there's a big league catcher right there. Uh, it, very very good with pitchers and, and defensively. And he tell his young guy. How, what do you want? What he needs to learn? Kepler lifts it high to center field. Jones is there to make the catch one away. And now the cold hard fact is brought to you by Cleveland Prince of Coors Light. And the Orioles have really struggled in the pitching department. On a batting average of 280, dead last in Major League Baseball. On base percentage 353, dead last. And the ERA an unsightly 5.07. And Bundy has struggled in his last four starts. He's only lasted 18 innings and given up, excuse me, 20 and a third innings and given up 18 earned runs. 1 and 0 oh now to Escobar. Bounced foul. Baltimore's team, ERA. Worst in the American League, the only team with a worse ERA, the Cincinnati Reds with a 5.20 ERA. Foul back. And it's one and two to Escobar. So often now you see if you'll watch catchers as we look at Buck Showalter with the, the Orioles dug out, they're going over hitters, twins hitters, and with Eduardo Escobar, so often now you see catchers. Hold the glove up high for the fastball here. Throw it up here. Yep, there it is. Throw it up there. And Escobar flares it over the reach of Giannis. He muscled one in there, didn't hit it well, but that's not he's he has trouble up there. Down down low. He's a terrific hitter. He just has great swings at it. That's where they're gonna try to get him up high there with fastballs. See the catcher's target up high, he throws it up there. Esco doesn't hit it well, but he, he has enough of it to muscle it over the shortstop's head. Man aboard, and now Eddie Rosario. Rosario with the average up to 288. I think Dylan Bundy is the kind of guy that Eddie Rosario ought to hit well. He ought to have three or four good at bats against against this fellow, only because he's around the plate all the time. The kind of pitches don't bother. Rosario so much it's guys that throw hard and throw it all around the uh, right. strike zone up high and down low anyway. and he's going to swing anyway. You get a guy that's around the plate a lot and, and I, I think the advantage shifts back to Eddie Rosario. Foul back. So if we were still playing pick the stick Eddie Rosario would be your pick. <laughs> I might I might pick Eddie Rosario. He's been really really good you see here since June 13th. He's been uh, Hitting like the uh, talented hitter that he is. And the average creeping, the season average, creeping towards 300. One and one. And a take, two and one. I blame uh, American League pitchers uh, as much for uh, Eddie Rosario's uh, surging bat as I do, uh, Eddie, as I uh, give credit to Eddie. He's a terrific hitter, but. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't throw an awful lot of strikes to him. I'd make, I'd make him prove I could walk to me that I could walk him. They're throwing him a lot of strikes. And he's pretty good on strikes. I'll tip that one two and two. 17 prior starts for Bundy, and he has 12 quality starts. So he's pretty reliable, at least by Baltimore standards. Now all the infielders swing over about 25 feet. With this uh, count reaching two strikes and two balls. That's to the left field corner and deep and foul. Rosario best tying the game by a few feet. Yeah. Not 
quite the distance or the uh, right angle. Another 2 2 coming. A second ago, we showed you how the Baltimore uh, defense has swung way around, as Dick said. It, and the reason they can get away with this, especially with Eddie Rosario, he does not have the kind of swing that he, he could hit a ground ball to straightaway third base. Right. He just can't do it. I mean, that, that swing cannot hit a ground ball over there. Out at second and no relay to first. So the third baseman Machado covering second base as Rosario hit a grounder into the shift. Two down and it'll bring up Polanco. Dropping down to the 235 range. But sitting in the 250 to 270 range almost all year long until the middle of June. Good time to snap out of it here, maybe with an extra base hit that'll get the Twins on the board. Fastball, that's strike one. Tied up last night by Parker Bridwell, who up until recently was property of the Baltimore Orioles. The Angels picked him up. He pitched a good ball game against the Twins, and now Bundy trying to wrap up a second scoreless hit. This one hit to the left field corner, and it'll be chased by Kim, and he is there for the catch to end the inning. Let's get ahead and leave a runner aboard, and after two, it's two nothing Baltimore. Have to pitch to Mike Trout. And now they're taking on the Orioles, and they won't have to pitch to Chris Davis. He's got an oblique issue. He's been out since the middle of June, and he won't get back to the middle of July. And you can see Davis has had some uh, subpar numbers this year as well, just hitting 226. Two nothing Baltimore, and Paul Yanish will lead things off in the third. And there's a first pitch strike from Jose Barrios. J.J. Hardy's out. With a broken right wrist hit by a pitch. So the Orioles have struggled on the field without two of their better players. Down and away, one and one. Dugout, one and two. On the ground. 
Brown. Polanco sets. So with the catch, one down. Let's go to Audra Martin. Well, guys, it's time for our big story, and our big story is the Astros, who continue to dominate, especially away from home. They've won nine of their last ten games on the road, and in their most recent road series, they outscored the Braves 26 to eight. That's a two-game series. Tonight, they're right back at it with the two-to-one lead over Toronto in the fifth, guys. No, well, Astros. Unstoppable. They're clearly the best team in the American League. They've got nine wins more than the next best record held by the Boston Red Sox in the American League. And the Twins are taking on a team that has really struggled on the road. Baltimore 15 and 28 away from Camden Yard. Here's Seth Smith hit a fly ball to Kepler to start the ball game. Missed 2 and 0. Oh. Change up just low. That was a really, really good change up. Good speed, good arm speed. Really good spot. Came back with it again and missed again. 3 0. Trumbo 3 0 and gave up a two run home run. Fastball and a strike. Was it adrenaline that got Barrios up to 96 miles per hour in that first inning? I don't think we've seen it since, have we? We have not seen 95 or 96 yet uh, since then. It probably was a little bit. 93. And Smith was late on it. Three and two. But I think 93 is is kind of where uh, Jose wants to pitch. If he's if he's going to pitch seven innings, or, uh, it, 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 then can't be at 95, 96 right from the, for for seven innings. He's got to be 93 with that movement on his fastball, and then get get that breaking ball where over where where he wants to throw it. He's not had good command of the breaking ball yet. And there's a the breaking ball, bounced foul. See that one right there is what Neil Allen was talking about just a little flat and and it's got a big break but especially uh, to uh, left hand hitters but both hit both sides of the plate really when the, when the breaking ball is flat even though it's big hitters see it better and it's tracks in uh, to the to the big end of the bat a little bit easier. Fastball at 96. Foul. Right. That's what he wants when he gets two strikes in. He wants to, he wants to try to strike somebody out with something up in the strike zone. He can reach back and get 96, but he doesn't need to pitch there every every fastball that he throws right from the very beginning of the game. Again, from a hitter standpoint, 93 with movement is tougher to hit than 96 and straight. Fisted to right. Kepler slides after making the catch two away. He got in on the trademark a little bit. Yep. Two down. Bring up Manny Machado. You can see where this ball is. Just just buries it in. It actually had a little bit of uh, cut movement on it, which is not something we see. And Kepler makes a nice play to come in and. Keep his concentration uh, ball all the way into the glove. You see those plays right there hitting guys in the heel of the glove as well, just like the ball to Sano, the throw to Sano. Kepler did a good job of watching it all the way into the glove. And Manny Machado, a bouncer to third, his first time up. And Barrios misses the inside corner. Missing two and zero. Another three zero count. You can kind of tell with body language and pitching mechanics when uh, Jose Barrios is not real comfortable out there, as he's not right now. Roller up the middle, and might have been another cracked bat. Machado's aboard with a two-out single. 
Jonathan Scope will hit next, but first a reminder that you have an invitation to join us Thursday, July 20th for the 1987 summer celebration at Target Field. You can enjoy an evening on the field with members of the 1987 Twins, including Bert Blyleben, Frank Viola, Gary Gaetti, Tim Laundry, Ken Herbeck, Roy Smalley, Dan Gladden, Tom Kelly, and more. The evening will feature interactive games, silent auction, program, dinner, and more. To learn more, get your tickets. Visit twinsbaseball.com slash summer celebration. It's going to be fun. Sculpt the batter. And a strike on the outside corner. Starting to talk about uh, Barrio's body language. When he first came up this year, and he was so good for so many games in a row, it just looked like he was in his mind. He was saying to the hitter, here, hit this. Here, hit this. Try this one. You can't hit this. And the last few starts, he's just been, it seemed a little bit more tentative. One of the reasons that'll make him feel that way is when, when he's not getting his curveball over, it's going to mess with his psyche a little bit because he really needs that curveball. Fastball makes the curveball really good, and getting the curveball over makes the fastball three miles an hour faster in a hitter's, uh, what a hitter sees. And so when a pitcher doesn't have all his uh, weapons when he's really comfortable, he starts getting a little uncomfortable. Nice pick up by Castro, but now it's two and one. See, he's really, really fighting that uh, release point on his uh, on his breaking ball. That's what Neil Allen was talking about. Young guys and uh, high-strung guys or emotional guys, as Burrios is, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean he wants to do really, really well. He's a high-energy guy. And they try to do too much. They just try to make they they try to throw it too hard. They try to make too perfect a pitch. Or when they know they're struggling with the mechanics, they really fight trying to find it. They don't just let it happen. That's that's going to be part of the learning process. That's what what we've been talking about since the opening of the show. How does he find himself when everything is not exactly perfect? Two and one, two gone here in the third. Popped up, backing out of play. He fidgets a lot. You watch him in between pitches, and you know he'll twitch out there, adjust the cap. Caught him a couple times today, blowing into his pitching hand. It's 99 degrees or whatever it is. He doesn't need to do that tonight, but he just does those things. He's not. He doesn't have the nervous ticks that Joe Nathan had as a closer. But that he has mannerisms. He has habits that he's probably not even aware that he does out there. Two and two. Too tall for Dozier. And Machado will hold up at second base. So a couple of two out singles, and Jones will come up with two men aboard. The ball not hit well, but enough arc on it to get it over Dozier. Yeah, muscled over the opposite field, uh, much like Escobar did to uh, Bundy. That ball got way in on him. He muscled. You know, when a guy's hot like Scope is, an all star uh, this year, having a terrific year, two things happen. Your mechanics are really good, which allow you to take uh, to get base hits on C swings, and then you get lucky a little bit more often than, uh, than, than other years. Jones reached on the Sano error and then scored on the Trumbo home run. He hit him with a breaking ball. He's missed wide of the plate to a lot of the right handed batters, and that one stuck uh, Jones between the shoulder blades, and now they're loaded up. For Trumbo. Well, he just absolutely loses the uh, release point and the grip on uh, that one. Tries to throw a breaking ball and misses badly. Leading the team now with seven hit batters, and Neil Allen thinks it's time to come out and have a chat. It's two to nothing, but now the Orioles have the bases loaded. Let's go back to. Rios to start in Baltimore because he had an inning like this. I mentioned that he gave up three runs on three solo home runs, but in the midst of all the solo home runs, there was an inning like this where the Orioles had the bases loaded. Of course, back at the time, Barrios was uh, still compared to the Barrios of 2016, but he got the third out. This was uh, the Orioles' start was just his third start of the season. He got the third out, left the bases full, then gave up a couple more solo home runs. What we saw last year is the home runs came in situations like this, and there were a lot of crooked numbers put up. 
see if he can get Trumbull who hit the two run home run on a 3 0 pitch first time he faced Burrios tonight. Breaking ball wide of the plate again. You know, I've heard Bird Blylevin talk an awful lot about uh, and here's the difference between somebody like Bird who is a he's speaking from experience a lot of years pitching well and, and a young guy Bird says you know when I threw a pitch like that and it wasn't my good curveball I wanted to come right back and throw it and throw it again and throw it and throw a good one. The difference is that when Bert didn't throw the pitch he wanted and come, he wanted to throw it again. He was relaxed. He was confident he was going to throw it right the next time. You get a young guy like this, they throw a bad curveball, like he, he, he can't find his curveball, and now he's really, really fighting it straight. It's, oh, this has got to be great. It's got to be great. It's a different mindset. Little roller. And Polanco just in time to get Trumbull. A raw run a long way to get to the ground ball. His throw just barely got trouble. You're watching Twins Baseball, presented by State Farm. Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Northland Ford. Visit buyfordnow.com and your local Northland Ford dealer today. By Grand Casino, the best stories start here. And by Menards. Save big money at Menards on all your home improvement needs. Not a big hole, a pot hole of sorts. 2 nothing Orioles as the Twins hit the bottom of the third. Jason Castro will lead things off with them. Play by Polanco with enough arm strength to get Trumbo to leave the bases full. And now Castro takes a strike on the outside corner. Bundy's doing a great job delivering first pitch strikes first time through the batting order. And that hit Castro. Then deflected and got Castillo. So the Twins get their leadoff man on here in the third inning with Buxton coming to the plate. And now for tonight's State Farm combination. And with the turn of the calendar page, Buxton, Kepler, and Rosario are all doing very, very well at the plate. Well, it's a great looking young outfield, isn't it? They can really go get the ball defensively. Kepler and Rosario starting to uh, flex their offensive muscles, and we're just starting to see Byron Buxton getting glimpses of where he's going to be at some point in time in his career. Popped up. He got jammed, but it's over the Twins dugout. One strike. Kepler, Rosario, and Buxton. 23, 24 years old. And if the twin 
Bearcats are going to stay in the race in the second half. I think we'll see across the board all three of those guys improve. Buxton slaps one to right field, a base hit. Castro to second base, and the Twins get the eighth and ninth batters on with nobody out. Oh, I can't tell you how much I like that, that base hit by Buxton right there, allowing himself to be jammed. You just don't. We have not seen him wait this long, let the ball travel this deep, and he didn't hit it well. He got it well down by the label, but we just have not seen him have that kind of inside-out swing. Castro better hustle up to second base than to throw him out. But I just, I, I just love the fact that that Byron hit that ball like that because it means he let the ball travel on the plate, got a good look at it. Something he was literally incapable of doing in April. Dozier takes a strike. It just seemed like Byron wanted to make contact with the ball a foot in front of the plate throughout the month of April, and that's one of the reasons the strikeout rate was so high. No question about it. That is the reason the strikeout rate was so high. One strike to Dozier. Twins looking for a big hit here to get this game tied up. Foul back two strikes. Buxton is able to get a huge lead at first base based on where the Orioles are placing Mancini. Mancini is a third of the way towards second base. Now it's insignificant unless there's a chopper to the left side. There's a real good chance Buxton's going to get to second base before they can force him because of the big lead he's getting at first. Two strikes to Dozier. Strikeout and on three pitches. Bundy dispatches Dozier. And that'll bring up Grossman. Challenged him with a high fastball, which is not something you see pitchers want to do with Brian very often, but Brian just a little bit off at the plate. He's not really, really sharp right now. When he misses that pitch, you know that there's something either going wrong mechanically or in his brain that he was uh, he was thinking about something else. Grossman way out in front, strike one. I think he got the same pitch and tapped it to short to lead off the ball game. Right. One strike to Grossman. Wins in search of at least a double to tie the game. Safe there, and Mancini made the wrong choice. Just what we were talking about. Buxton not with as big a lead as he had during the Dozier at bat, but still a big lead. And they're loaded up now with one down. Grossman reaches on a fielder's choice. Well, you have to know who the runners are and, and what plays. It's going all the way back to Little League. You say it, you're told, what am I going to do with the ball if it's hit to me? And if a ball's hit slowly to me at first base, and Byron Buxton's on first, I think I put that in my glove and trot over to first base and, and get an out. The manager always wants to get an out, and there's just no way that they were going to beat Byron Buxton in the back. Now, instead of facing Sano with first base open, they have to pitch to him with the bases loaded and one out. Sano singled his last time up last night, but struck out swinging in the first. Against Bundy tonight. Up high, and another breaking ball. And Sano's been getting plenty of those in this homestand. And he's going to continue to get a lots and lots and lots of breaking balls until he makes people really pay on that pitch. And he's not going to get a lot of fastballs to hit. The one the fastballs he wants to hit until he until he makes them really pay on the breaking ball. One and oh. Foul back. The raw speed pitch. Yeah, that was a hanger. That was a uh, grand slam waiting to happen right there. And Bundy just got away with it. Just a really ugly pitch from his standpoint. That, was, that pitch right there goes up as Jack Morris would say. He, Jack would start screaming as soon as he let that ball go, knowing that that was. That was going to end up in a really bad spot in the strike zone and potentially in the stands. 
course, Jack didn't throw that many that he had to scream at, but once in a while. Down and away, two and one for the fastball. What young hitters need to learn is that pitchers, big league pitchers, will show you fastball, and you think that that means that they're trying to throw it where you want it, but they're really not. They'll show you fastball to make you think you're going to get one, but the one they want you to hit is not the fastball. Raw speed pitch tapped weakly up the third base. That was a changeup, and that's what I'm getting at. Sano's seen just enough fastballs to make him unsure about what he, whether or not he might get one to hit. The fastball's been out of the strike zone. But the fastball's been out of the strike zone. And, and that's by design. That's the pitcher is not missing there. The pitcher's throwing it exactly that fastball off the play exactly where he wants it. Two two. And now three and two. Bases are loaded and Kepler is on deck. Castro is hit by a pitch. Buxton single. Grossman reached on a fielder's choice. The two nothing Baltimore lead is in peril. And Miguel Sano cannot, cannot assume that this three and two pitch means it's going to be a fastball. He cannot assume it might be, but probably not. Oh. Drill to right field. Buxton held up momentarily. It'll drive in one, and Sano cracks a solid single to right field to score Castro. And that was a fastball, and you'll notice that he was waiting long enough to be sure. You have to be able with two strikes you have got to be able to see the ball long enough. So here's the pitch by pitch. There's a bad curveball. Now a, another one that he gets away with. Show him a fastball. Change up. Change up. Fastball out over the plate that Sano has a wonderful approach on weights to make sure it's not the change up and drives it to right field. That's a beautiful at bat. Now Max Kepler with the bases loaded. Hit a fly ball to center his first time up. For Sano, his 61st run batted in of the year. Aaron Judge leads the league with 65. Liner left center field, down for a hit. Buxton will score. Grossman coming around to score, and the Twins take the lead. Kepler backs up Sano's hit with one of his own. And again, with the bases loaded, you don't have to do anything more than make sure you get a ball out over the plate, stay in the center of the diamond. That ball got in on him a little bit, but his. His approach was so good he was able to muscle that ball into left center. Another really good at bat. There's two really, really good ones in a row. Well, let's go back to the first hit of this inning. All three hits have gone to the opposite field. Buxton's, Sano's, and now Kepler's. And now Eduardo Escobar with an opposite field single his first time up. He got jammed and just looped it over the shortstop. 2 twins lead. Two on, still only one out. Off speed pitch and strike one. Driven to right field. Smith is back. It's high off the wall and takes a diagonal bounce. Two runs will score. Escobar to third. He will be held with a two run triple. It's the first time I can remember a line drive hitting that angled wall above the 365 sign. And if the ball had stayed on the warning track, it might have been an inside the park home run. You ever seen one? Bounce like that? I, I have not. What I and again, Escobar, low ball hitter. It doesn't matter if it's a fastball or a changeup. He just sees it well down there. That was a changeup. And watch this. There's only one spot in the ballpark he could do that. It hit 
the, not only the angle, Dick, but it looked like it hit the corner of the uh, message board, the scoreboard out there, and kangarooed way over to uh, right field. What I do remember is that when we first moved in this ballpark in 2010, Michael Kadire was out there in right field and talked about all the various places right. that it could hit. Right. And it can hit the limestone or it can hit the more plywood like underneath the limestone or it can hit the padding. And he even talked about that little angle right there that uh, Escobar just hit. But we've never, I've never seen one hit there before. 1 and 0 oh with the infield in. Rosario takes a strike. If, again, if that ball had stayed on the warning track, it ended up being slowed up by the grass. But if it, it had kept rolling another 10 feet, Escobar may have been sent home. Nothing Smith could do about it. Outside, <laughs> two and one. That's just not an outfield wall carom that Seth Smith no. ever thought he was going to see. No. They were here for early BP, and outfielders get used to the different caroms. And I'm guessing no one hit a fungo against the <laughs> corner of the scoreboard. Two and one to Rosario. Three and one. Polanco on deck. Thirteenth five run inning or more. And you're some pretty heady company if you're in any offensive category with the Astros and Yankees. And now Rosario draws a walk, and Polanco will be the ninth man to bat here in the third. Target Field's a great place to spend time with the people who are important to you. Groups of 25 or more are eligible for discounts on tickets, and per ticket fees are eliminated. Arrange your group of 25 plus today. Visit twinsbaseball.com slash groups or call 833 twins. Ask about a twins target field group outing. Well, pile on, boys. He's got five on the board. And Polanco in position to do more damage. Kepler with a two run single. Escobar a two run triple. Escobar with a single and a triple, and we're just in the third inning. High and tight. Be as sharp as he was in the first couple innings has really struggled here. It all started by hitting Castro with a pitch to start the inning. Third inning activity in the Baltimore bullpen. Popped up over the Baltimore dugout. One and one. I think this inning is an example, a great example of why the uh, Twins are, you know, we saw that statistic of uh, why they have scored so many five plus run innings. They have the tendency and the ability, and I think that man right there and James Rousen have, have instilled in these guys to uh, grind out of bats and take what the pitcher is going to give you rather than try to manufacture something outside of your. Uh, of your ability to uh, to hit a certain pitcher. Gene Mock used to say sometimes you hit pitchers like you like you can not like you want to. And line drive to uh, right field by Sano line drive to left center by the left hander Kepler uh, uh, line drive to right field by uh, even weekly by Buxton. And these guys are just and, and then they mix in walks all during during these kind of innings they mix walks in there. What a stop at first by Mancini. They'll get one but not two and another run will score. Polanco hit a one hop rocket. Mancini made a nice pickup got the force at second but no double play and Escobar scores the sixth run of the inning. Well, that is a really, really nice reaction play because you're right, that ball was scalded. He also get pops to his feet uh, in a hurry. He had a chance to get to. Polanco just gets down the line too quickly. Nice play by Trey Vincent. And now Castro, who was hit by a pitch to start the six run inning. Just got hit again, and the ball nearly thrown down the right field line. Royals are idle. The Indians are leading the Padres seven to two in the sixth inning in progressive field.
best case scenario the Twins win their game they'd be a half game behind Kansas City and a game and a half behind Cleveland. One and oh to Castro. And Polanco simply falls over and reaches first base. Six runs, all of them earned against Bundy. And he's looking to get his ninth out. Right now, as he's trying to retire Castro in his last five starts, he's given up 24 earned runs in 23 innings. That's not what the Orioles need. From the most reliable starting pitcher they've had this year. Strike called, and it's two and one. We're talking about best case scenarios in the standings, and as I look at this series, like the best case, of course, it's not the best case, but a very, very good case scenario for me is that the Twins win this series. Right. They win three out of yep. four. They gain two games on 500. They finish the. Uh, they go into the All-Star break four games over. Call the strike at Polanco. Steal second without a throw. He was halfway to second base by the time Bundy threw to the plate. And Castillo feeling a little bit like Miguel Montero last week. <laughs> But I'm guessing Castillo won't say anything about it. <laughs> two and two to Castro. Well, I don't know. I, it might be easier to say something about Dylan Bundy than it was about Arietta. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a, an argument you're not going to win in that organization. No, and then the Blue Jays pick him up. Detroit. That's, that's got to be a, a tough fit in the clubhouse in Toronto, doesn't it? Regardless of whether the guy can play or not, I mean that's just it's a mid-season you know, yeah. shoehorning somebody right. into a clubhouse. <laughs> mid-season intrusion. Yes. Two and two. And Castro lashes it to left, and coming in to make the catch is Kim to end the inning. Boy, was it a good one for the Twins. Sano drove in the first run and a bunch of other. Twins chipped in a six run inning and they take a 6 2 lead as we head to the fourth. Six run third inning, and we head to the fourth inning. And Barrios is essentially in the same spot he was in in Kansas City. 
after three innings. It was a five to one lead after three innings against the Royals. Now it's six to two. And he'll face Trey Mancini to start the fourth inning. Outside, ball one. I think this is a very, very, very important inning for Jose Barrios. For not the least of which, because of what you just said. Base hit left field, and Mancini can run. Rosario can't get it. It'll go all the way to the wall, and the fourth inning starts with a double. You know, we've talked so much about uh, when your team uh, puts a big number on the board and gets you a lead. Go right back out there and put a zero on, get your team back in the in the, uh, in the dugout. Eddie Rosario trying to cut it off. That was going to be a double anyway. But back to uh, Barrios, get your team back in, very important, but also get some confidence in, in yourself and on the mound, get that your mechanics are going to be all right, that you can throw the pitches where you want to. And, and then, not the least of it, is just what you said about expunging the memories of Kansas City. You want to shrug off the two run home run in the second, okay, but Barrios really struggled to get through the third inning. And so he'd like to have an uneventful fourth. Getting ahead of Castillo one strike, then Kim and Janish. The seven, eight, and nine batters hitting now with Mancini at second base. One strike. Breaking ball over, strike two. There was a good one. That was the first curveball that's more like his real good one that we've seen today. And sometimes when a pitcher finally gets that feeling, sometimes that even more than finding the fastball release point, sometimes just throwing that breaking ball over can right the ship. I've never understood it because to the layman like me, it doesn't make any sense, but we've seen it before. Pitchers struggling with fastball command. Catcher will call a curveball, they'll throw it for a strike. For some reason, it seems to lock the guys in. Well, exactly right. And what happens is because you have to wait longer in your delivery to throw the breaking ball well, and you have to get out, really get out in front and over the top on the curveball, then you, you wait a little longer, a little more relaxed, you flip it in there, and then all of a sudden everything comes together. Oh, that's my mechanics. That's where I have to be. Yeah, I see there's <laughs> that was the first one was a little bit was the almost there. That one was there. That's that's the one he wants. See now here I am this late in my life and you explained it to me. I said it doesn't make any sense but now that makes perfect sense. One down and Mancini still at second base. And Kimball back. Kim called out on strikes his first time up. Rio's not doing the best job of delivering first pitch strikes. Nine for 17. One to know. And now two and zero. Strike percentage is down from where we've seen Barrios most of the time. 67 pitches, 38 strikes, 57 percent strikes. We've seen him typically in the 60s, low to mid 60s. Two and oh. Squaring the butt. No ball three. Castro to the mound and Escobar to the mound as well. Now you watch uh, Rio's front shoulder right here. It's going to come open really early. Flies open and look at where, how the arm lags behind, and that's why that's up and away like that. There's two things that's going to happen when you fly open. You're either going to bring it with you and throw the ball to the screen against the right hand hitter like you did uh, earlier, or you're going to leave it. Uh, your arm's going to drag. Uh, behind your uh, shoulders, and you're going to leave it up and away like that. It looked like Castro was crossed up, even on that pitch. Three and zero. Oh. There's a strike on the outside corner. 
I think Castro went out there. I, I don't think he was crossed up. I think it was he just wasn't expecting it to be that up and away for him to miss that far. And I think he went out there and reminded him, stay back, keep your front shoulder in, relax, you know, just pick up my glove. You know, that, that's what catchers, one of the biggest things that they can do for pitching. Base hit to right field, Mancini to third. He'll be held there. First to third, one down for the number nine batter, Paul Janish. Saturday at 6 on Fox, Eric Hosmer of the Royals take on the Dodgers. And then the Cincinnati Reds take on Paul Goldschmidt and the Diamondbacks at 9 only on FS1. See if the Dodgers can slow down the Royals. 44 and 40 after a dreadful April. They're playing as good as anybody in the league right now, including the Houston Astros. Speaking of the Astros, Twins will go to Houston to play a Houston. Right after the All Star break. Here is Yana. Should a ground ball to short his first time up. Let's see that again. Squaring the bunt, taking a strike. Yana just two hits and 24 at bats. And he's in the lineup because J.J. Hardy is out of the lineup with a busted wrist. Tim Laudner had a great, just a great comment uh, today. He said, I think I spent my whole career as a catcher. Tell, and he actually said it to that man, Juan Castro. He said, I think I spent my whole career saying to pitchers, stay back, keep your arm up, keep your front shoulder in. He said, I think I spent my whole career saying that to every pitcher I've got. The dribbler, Escobar will have to hurry to get one out, no chance to get two. Coming in is Mancini at six to three, and on the play, Kim goes to second. Let's go to Audra Martin. Well, guys, Jose Brios hitting 95, 96 miles an hour earlier might be because of Neil Allen's game plan this week. He took all the starting pitchers and backed them off substantially from their side sessions this week, saying that it's all about the big picture. With the mental fatigue setting in, physical fatigue, backing them up this week makes the All-Star break that much more beneficial. And when the dog days of August roll around, it can make a big difference. He said it was a big factor in Irvin Santana's success last night. Hopefully it will be that case with Jose and the rest of the guys this weekend. Guys. Thank you very much, Audra. You do have to pace yourself, and I think teams, not just the Twins, teams in general are much more sensitive to energy expenditure, trying to budget things over the course of a long season. Pitch count kind of predated where we're at now, but that's kind of a part of it, trying to look at a pitcher's 34 starts rather than extending them beyond a limit for any particular one. I can get away saying that with you because if I tried saying that in front of Jack Morris or Bert Blyleven they throw me into the corner. Yeah and I'm laughing uh, on behalf of, uh, of those two thinking somewhere Bob Gibson is throwing up a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> a little dribbler. Castro wants it. Nice play. That and he springs out of the catcher's box to end the inning. Such a good play by the catcher. Get away from that pitcher. I'm going to come and get you out of this thing.
Toyota will get us caught up. Well, Mark Trumbo got was <laughs> caught up with a 3 0 fastball, divided over the center field fence after an error. Give the Orioles a 2 0 lead. Twins would load the bases. Miguel Sano with a great at bat drove in the first one. Max Kepler with a great at bat drove in two more. That made it 3 2, gave the Twins a lead. And Eduardo Escobar would walk up and drill a changeup off the right center field wall to drive in two more. Currently stands 6 3. Twins here as they hit in the bottom of the fourth. Buxton taking strike one. He and just about everybody else who got a hit got a hit to the opposite field in the six run inning. A check swing one on one. The only hit that was pulled was Escobar's two run triple. All the other hits went to the opposite field. One and one. They trying to have a quicker fourth inning. I am tight two and one. Figured it out. Just imagine that component into an already pretty good lineup. Well, that's what I've been telling people all season long when I when I talk to uh, talk to folks and they ask me about the Twins. I, I, I my comment has been, if he ever figures it out, you will not believe the change in this ball club. You will not believe how he will impact a dynamic, positive change in in, in this lineup. It, it, more than I think anybody else, potentially even uh, than Miguel Sano. I think he will figure it out, and it's going to be some kind of good at some point in time because he will change everything for this team. In April, he struck out 43% of the time, and in the last 24 games, roughly a month's worth of games, he's striking out 25% of the time. Big fly ball to short center field. Jones jogs in. One down. The one, the one thing I have to say about uh, Byron too, the most important thing I think for people to remember is that he's trying to make a gigantic mechanics change in his swing at the major league level with big league pitchers working on him. It, and I was talking with James Rouse in there, the, uh, the Twins hitting coach, and we were both just kind of shaking our heads in amazement, saying, "Do you realize what kind of talent this kid has? That he's even doing as well as he is trying to make this change." And, at this level it's it's remarkable and we're just going to have to be patient. Here's Dozier. Twins have used up two options on Buxton. And in the midst of all his struggles one of the factors might have been the fact that they only have one year's worth of options left on Byron. And teams are always reluctant to use that last option. And so to your point you know it's tough on the player. Requires patience in the organization, but maybe it'll be a moot point. Maybe he is figuring things out, and the chances of him being optioned back to AAA uh, won't exist. I know this. Well, he's a great young man, but nobody works harder. Right. He is so diligent right. in his work ethic, and if all it's going to take is some patience and work ethic, the Twins have shown the patience. And Buxton's got the work ethic. Well, I tell you what makes it an awful lot easier for all of us, including right through his manager and teammates, to have a little patience is the way he plays that position. Yeah. Yep. That, that makes it an awful lot easier. 2 2 to Dozier. And just off the corner. And Bundy not happy with that ball three call. Yeah, I don't blame him there. I don't know uh, if that ball was uh, right on the corner or not. It certainly was a pitcher's pitch, and he's exactly where he was trying to throw it. I understand his frustration. Good pitch. And Dozier lifts it foul down the right field line. It's been a struggle for Bundy. He was sailing through two innings, and then the Twins jumped on him for six runs. It was third inning bullpen activity. Three two to Brian Dozier. On the ground, couple of hops. 
to Yanish. Over to Mancini, two down. Twins baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by State Farm, here to help life go right with the auto and renders protection you deserve. Mentioned options, and players have three years worth of options. It used to be back when you played, I think, uh, where every time you sent a player down, you used up an option, and I believe there were six options on a player. This is going from memory, and that's not the most reliable thing for me to do these days. But then they changed it to three years worth of options. So you have three, you can go back and forth as often as you'd like, as Ryan Presley has, not as you would like, but as the organization <laughs> would like. One and oh to Grossman, and now, or 0 and 1, now 0 and 2. Bundy was out of options last year, and the Orioles knew that if they tried to pass him through waivers, somebody would claim him. So he was on. The Oriole Major League roster all year long, even though he hadn't pitched much in prior years with injury situation, a check swing. But they got a little over 100 innings out of him and now hope to get in the neighborhood of 150 to 180 innings from him this year. One and two. He made 14 starts last year. High and tight, right, two and two. And pitched 109 and two thirds innings. Old foul. Grossman 0 for two. He struck out in the first. His 45th strikeout. He has drawn 44 walks. Let's see if he matches his first inning strikeout with a walk here in the fourth inning. Driven hard to right field. Smith is back. Makes a leaping catch on the edge of the warning track. Nice play by Seth Smith. And Bundy has a 1 2 3 fourth inning. Didn't look like he was going to be able to get there. Didn't look comfortable, but he made the play. See fans of the game enjoying a sultry summer night here at Target Field. It is beautiful. No complaints. This is just gorgeous. It certainly I, is. And a, uh, it's hot and it's humid, but it's July. It should be. Oh, that's baseball for me. Yep, yep. Machado takes inside ball one. Barrios would love to have a nice tidy fifth inning here. Nearly full moon. Suspended down the right field line over this gorgeous ballpark. There's a strike on the outside corner, one and one. Break 
breaking ball out in front. A little pop up behind second base. Polanco grabs it. One down. Congratulations to Mike Moustakas, who probably has already won the Comeback Player of the Year award. And now he's going to the All Star game. He will be Miguel Sano's opponent in the first round of the Home Run Derby. And Justin Turner winning the final ballot, the final vote in the National League, which means the only Cub going to the All Star game this year is Wade Davis. And he wasn't even on their World Series team last year. Another pop up, this one on the right side of the infield. Dozier wants it. Isn't that incredible that the Cubs were, who were the feel good story of the decade in baseball, winning the World Series? And all these good young players, Schwarber sent down to Iowa, all the back uh, today. Bryant, all of them, and no one made the All Star team. <laughs> Which is why they're uh, not running away with it again, well, again this year. I, you know, it's it, when you win the world, when you get to the World Series, and then and then it's just getting to the World Series, you've had several guys on your team have career years. I mean, real all of all at the same time. Four or five guys having wonderful years. I mean, that's just the way it happens for everybody. That's how you get them. And it's very difficult to put two career years in, in, uh, together in a row for the same six guys. It's, it's it's hard to do. One strike to Jones. I find equally amazing is that a guy hitting 384 had to go to the uh, to the <laughs> special vote. Holy cow! I mean, really? It's got a thousand plus, you know, one point right. something something on base plus. So he hit 384. He had to get voted in. Line to center. Jones has a base hit with two down in the fifth. Well, the what? 23 first timers going to the All Star game, which of course is tremendous for the game. Yeah, it really is great. And, and, and let's tip our cap to the fans who. Acknowledged that Machado was not having a good year, and so he did not get uh, nearly the amount of votes everyone anticipated. Everyone thought, "Wow, all right, Machado in the American League at third base, Jose Ramirez, and then you know, so and so afterward." But you know, Machado did not fare well in the voting, and he should hitting 217. Right, right. Fans did a great job this year. I think it's the information age that we're in. You know, you can pick up phone and find out you know what the count is during <laughs> right. you know Machado's third at bat in a ball game. Yep. Well it's that plus I think people are really paying attention. I think baseball is exciting uh, again to people and there's there are a lot of great stars in the game and great young players and, and, and that's fun and you're right it is it's a credit to the game it's great for baseball. It's a credit to the fans for paying attention. I think it's great. One and one now to Trumbo with Jones aboard and two down. Rios had a one two three inning. And it's kind of been a pig wrestle for him ever since. Guys on base. Errors behind him. Pat foul. Suing Major League Baseball. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. One and two. Swing and a miss. Trumbo strikes out, leaving Jones aboard. The Twins leading through four and a half. And you're watching Twins Baseball presented by State Farm.
Hitting now in the bottom of the fifth and before the first swing, make your picks for the T-Mobile T-Mobile Home Run Derby Bracket Challenge with a little luck. You and three friends may be going to the 2017 World Series thanks to T-Mobile. Make your picks at MLB.com slash bracket challenge. And as we mentioned, Miguel Sano will be in a bracket with Mike Mustakas of the Royals. Checked his swing and took ball two. Sano cracked a single to right field, driving in a run. He later scored a run in the six run third inning. Big swing and a miss, two and one. You know, that Mustaka Sano pairing in the uh, home run derby bracket is interesting and it, it's exemplary of, of the different kinds of legitimate home run hitters there are and that anybody any one of them can get hot at the right time and win it. Another off speed pitch and a swing and a miss. Where Sano might hit a whole bunch of them 400 plus feet. Mustakas could hit a whole lot of them to straightaway right field 375 right. feet but they're just two different kind of hitters. Meanwhile Miguel Sano having trouble staying on off speed stuff change ups and curve balls. He's not way out in front. He's just not squaring them up. Oh, fastball and he dribbles one foul. Let's take a look at the bracket. It'll be Sano and Mustakas in the first round for Miguel. Some controversy about whether Gary Sanchez should even be in the event, given the fact he's spent so much time on the disabled list. He'll be going against the hometown favorite, Giancarlo Stanton. And a call, third right strike. That's a really good changeup on the outside corner right there. And Miguel just not not seeing the off-speed stuff really, really well right now. But if we look at it right here. This is a this is a that's a, a pitcher's pitch. I mean that's right on the corner corner. Beautiful pitch. One down and now Kepler, two run single and a run scored in the third. How about if Aaron find the finals? It pits Aaron Judge against John Carl Stanton. Would there be some blast going out of that ballpark? Oh my goodness, that would be fireworks. You know what could very well happen to any of the, the favorites. I don't know how you handicap something like this anyway, but let's say it's Aaron Judge. He may hit 27 home runs in the first round or whatever and be tired as Josh Hamilton right. was when uh, Justin Morneau won it at Yankee Stadium. Well that's why I said a guy like Mustakas can win if he just kind of hangs around, right. you know. Yeah. I mean it, you, you don't have to hit. 47 of them in any one round. You just have to you have to hit enough of them to keep advancing. Two and one to Kepler. Three and one. Escobar on deck. But I still think if Judge and Stanton got to the finals, that we would see a combined home run yardage total uh, measured <laughs> in miles. Kepler takes outside and it's a one out ball. That'll get us to Escobar. Can't miss a bet of the summer. Hit South Beach when baseball's biggest stars take the field for the MLB All Star Game Tuesday only on Fox. I think it's fair to say that in terms of buzz, at least the buzz that I've been exposed to, there's, there's more of it regarding the home run hitting contest than the game itself. Feels that way. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, or for that matter, if it's if it's even accurate. But there just seems to be more of a buzz about the home run hitting contest. Basically, all it is—it's a long drive contest, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. One strike to Escobar. Well, let's hope Miguel handles things well and enjoys the experience, whether he wins it or not. It's an honor to be invited. Up and away. Who's going to pitch to him? Do you know? Fernando Tatis, oh. former major leaguer, who was kind of a yep, he was kind of a mentor to uh, Miguel, to down. Miguel down in Dominican. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's good for them. That's great. Follow back. I imagine Tatis has thrown a few batting practice pitches to Sano in the wintertime. 
told the story before, and I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. One of the best practical jokes I ever heard of was uh, we went to Dodger Stadium years ago. He sopped Choi hit three home runs against Brad Rack. Steve Little, one of the coaches for the Twins, got a copy of Dodger Stationery and forged a letter supposedly from Hesop Choi asking Brad Rackey if he would pitch to him <laughs> in the home run <laughs> hitting contest. <laughs> and I don't think it, Brad, it took Brad too long to figure out that it was not Hesop Choi who actually sent him the letter, but that was that was a pretty good setup. Two and two to Escobar. Who has a single and a triple already in the ball game? More activity for the Orioles in the bullpen. Richard Blyer, who was warming up in the third inning, now warming up again in the fifth. Pitch count for Bundy. He's getting close to 100 pitches. Two and two to Escobar. Pulled foul. I've been uh, reminded by my friends on Twitter, a number of them, to where I believe it actually happened that Jim Tomey hit one off that angled wall for his lone triple in uh, a Twins uniform. Well, if Jim Tomey were going to hit a triple, something really weird was going to have to happen. There's no, <laughs> there's no question about that. Two and two. Popped up. Left side of the infield, easy play for Machado. Two down. And that will bring up Rosario. Only in Minnesota can you experience golf quite like this. The wilderness at Fortune Bay is set among the majestic pines and dramatic rock outcroppings on the shores of Lake Vermilion. One of the top ranked golf courses in the country with numerous play and stay packages. The wilderness is a true golfer's dream. Find endless ideas for the perfect getaway at exploreminnesota.com slash escapes. Share your favorites with hashtag only an MN. Roller to the right side. Scope with the play. And the twins are done in the fifth. We go to the sixth. They lead it six to three. Twins still lead the Orioles six to three. We're now inside the Minnesota State Lottery winner's circle with Marlene from New Folden. Marlene, you're here with your family. Who's here with you tonight? Uh, my grandson, Keaton Tillett, my grandson, Bentley Tillett, and my daughter, Jenny Tillett. And you guys drove quite a long distance for a very special occasion. It's actually their first games. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yes. Big baseball fans in the family? Yes. Well, 
Bert has a night off, but it's Roy Smalley who's going to be circling you tonight. We're also going to give you guys $100 worth of scratch-off tickets from the Minnesota Lottery, and hopefully that will make this first baseball game even more special for the guys. Wow, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the game. We will. Thank you, thank you. much. Guys. Well, thank you very much. New fold us. Well, I'm guessing that's at least a good four or five hour drive from the uh, Twin uh, City, uh, Twin Cities here, north and west of Thief River Falls. You just keep going on Highway 59, and uh, you'll end up at New Folden. Before you get to Carlstad, if you get to Carlstad on your way to New Folden, you better turn around and go back. Mancini to the batter. And he hits another smash to left field. Now the carom this time comes to Rosario. Mancini digging for second, and the throw is offline. It'll be another leadoff double for Trey Mancini. His second of the ball game. I don't think there's much question that that young man can hit a baseball. He got it, took a really good curveball, and then was all over the next fastball. The curveball didn't seem to get in his mind one little bit, and he roped it down the left field line. Inside, bring his hands inside so that the barrel can get out to uh, the ball on an inside pitch and keep it fair at the same time. Rosario got, Rosario got to the ball quickly, which is one of his best skills out there in left field, but the throw a little offline. Pitch is up to Wellington Castillo. Now there's some activity in the Twins' bullpen. Mancini led off the fourth with a double and ended up scoring on a fielder's choice to make it a 6 3 ball game. One and oh. Now fouled wide at first. Tyler Duffy, first arm getting loose. One and one. Three runs scored against Barrios, two of them earned, one of them unearned because of the Sano error in the second inning. He struck out, Barrios did. He struck out Castillo, leaving Mancini in second back in the fourth inning. Ball missing up and in two and two. See you see right there Castillo again. There's a there's the <laughs> Timmy Lautner mantra there. Stay back, get your arm up, shoulder toward the <laughs> toward the, uh, the the glove here. But he knows that they had uh, Castillo set up for the good breaking ball. He jammed him twice with fastballs. If he could have thrown that good breaking ball out there on the outside part, they had him, but he, he overthrew it. He didn't get what he wanted. Rounder. Picked up Polanco throwing across and they got the out. And the ball skipping by Barrios and fielded by Polanco. That was a pretty good sequence by Jorge <laughs> Polanco. He got the deflection off of Escobar's love for the out. Then he backed up third base and got the deflected throw from Sano. That's a terrific play by that young man all the way around. So you see. The curveball was a ha bit of a hanger, and Castillo got the big end of the bat on it, just off of Escobar's glove. But Polanco makes a terrific athletic play to get rid of the ball quickly. Sano handles the little two hopper there, and then gets excited about getting this runner and throws the ball into the dirt. And a run would have scored if Polanco had his momentum; it carried him into foul territory anyway. Yep. So he stayed there just. Waiting for that errant throw. Good play. Twenty sixth batter faced by Barrios, and he's thrown first pitch strikes to half of them. One and zero oh to Kim, who singled in the fourth inning to right field, to left, and retreating as Rosario. He'll get the out, and the Orioles will get the run. Tagging is Mancini, and it's six to four.
partial season ticket packages are now available in the Delta Sky 360 Club and Catch. Become a Twins season ticket holder today. Become part of the Sweet Spot program. Learn more at twinsbaseball.com or by calling 833 Twins. Number nine batter Paul Yanish batting. What I gotta believe will be the last man for Barrios. Certainly, the hope is that he'll get Yanish and complete six innings with three earned runs, four runs total. The prudent thing probably would be and the game over to the bullpen with Barrios a little over 100 pitches perhaps. My guess is that Paul has seen uh, Jose uh, fight his uh, command long enough. He gets through six innings here with the lead, and I think that that will uh, he'll he'll feel good about that. Of course, if he doesn't get Yanish and he has to face Seth Davis, well then Duffy's warmed up and we might see a change here this inning already. That's foul by about four feet. See, there's the flat hanging one right there, and it, it, you know. Sometimes outs and foul balls are uh, as indicative to a manager as uh, as anything else about uh, how he feels about staying with his pitcher. And what we're seeing uh, now from uh, Brios is just at no time has he found it for any consistency. He found the command. The curveball ball is struggling with in the dirt or else or else leaving it hanging over the middle of the plate. Every once in a while he'll throw the really good one, but he just can't seem to find it consistently. Pretty good one. He a gets a better. chopper to third. Escobar fires across. The inning end. Mancini hits another leadoff double and scores at six to four. Twins Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Chevrolet, the number one selling brand in the Twin Cities. Council for Manager Paul Molitor, who I thought, I'm sure, probably right away understood that Rios didn't have his best stuff. And the new pitcher for the Orioles is left hander Richard Blyer. Blyer has come up from the uh, AAA affiliate for the uh, Orioles and really pitched pretty well, especially in a, mostly in a kind of a long man uh, situation uh, for them. Jorge Polanco will hit right handed, of course, squaring the bunt and taking strike one. Picked up in February from the Yankees for a player to be named later. That player won't be Aaron Judge. <laughs> I guess the Orioles would hold the Yankees a player, and the player won't be Manny Machado. Although some people think eventually that's where Machado may end up. He's got one year left of 
Orioles control. Two strikes to Polanco. Soft line drive, glove by Giannis, one down. Let's find Audra Martin. Guys, our showstopper tonight is Edwin Encarnacion having a huge night for the Indians. So far, four for five, including his 18th home run of the season. That means he's now just a triple shy of the cycle. Now, he did have a triple on Sunday, but it was his first since 2014. So chances of him going for the cycle, maybe not so great, but it'll be interesting to keep an eye on that game as they are clobbering the Padres so far tonight, guys. Padres did all they could to help the Twins winning a couple ball games in Cleveland. And Castro with a sharp single past the only infielder on that side of the infield, Machado, and he's aboard with a one out hit. And that'll bring up Byron Buxton. In the comment last night that what we're seeing from Buxton now in terms of his stance and his stride or lack thereof, very similar to the guy on the left. Remember Paul Molitor when he was with the Twins and with the Jays. Just the subtlest pickup of the front foot and the stride, and that's kind of what we're seeing from Buxton, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And you know, Paul was almost, we showed that relatively slow speed. Paul was Paul's movement to his back leg was almost imperceptible. It looked like he had no backward movement at all. Truth, he really did. Every hitter has to get gathered on his back leg in, in order to drive inside to his front leg. But Byron is now trying to tone down his uh, legs, just get back just a little bit, keep his front foot on the ground. And you, you see right there, he's getting the big end of the bat for the ball so much easier now. He got two hits last night. The two times he was retired, he had a ground ball just like that to Andrelton Simmons. It just, this one found the hole, and the two last night were hit right at the shortstop. So you see right here, no movement from his uh, front leg, and that allows his arms to work in a better plane back at the ball. Whereas when he was picking up the front leg, he would land a little bit open. A lot for that man to smile about right there, because James <laughs> Rousen knows that if he can help get Byron Buxton going, as I said, everything's going to change for this Twins lineup. But just to finish the thought, Buxton a lot better. Directly to the ball with the big end of the bat without that big leg. Kick. Everyone enjoying a beautiful night at the ballpark. Strike one to Dozier. Ryan drove in the lone twin to run last night, but 0 for 3 tonight. Two ground balls to short and a strikeout. Well, good time uh, for another uh, crooked number inning here. I just get the feeling that the Twins are going to need to score another couple runs in this game. 0-2 to Dozier. Among right-handed batters, Dozier is the Twins' best at hitting left-handed pitching. Hitting left-handers at a 3.38 clip, 23 hits, 68 at bats. Takes low on the 1 and 2. As it stands, the reason among left-handers he's the best too. It's just see what Bryant's done. Very uh, destructive hitter against lefties. Yeah, left-handers don't have a lot to get Bryant out with. They, they, they really don't. They can't throw the ball by him with a fastball and, and for, for the most part. And the breaking ball is coming into him rather than away. So being a pull hitter, he can just kind of let the ball come in there and, and have at it. Like I said earlier, he's not real sharp right now. I don't know if he's not seeing the ball real well or just something a little bit uh, funny with his uh, with his mechanics. Well, he missed a game the other day with a sore lower back, so it's plausible to conclude that maybe he's not 100% physically. Back problems usually don't go away in a day. One and two. And, uh, two and two. On that note, of course, uh, it directly brings up the situation surrounding Joe Maurer, who did play in the ball game yesterday, not in the lineup today because of some tightness in his lower back. Sure, would like to see Joe play in this series, and, but on the other hand, having four days off and, uh, here, five days off, starting yesterday and then the All Star break, he should be, I would think, he's back and be fine to start the second half. 
Two and two to Dozier. Another strikeout. Two down. And that'll bring up Grossman. He's trying to like the way you always put it on the telecast. Change the number. It's been stuck at six too long. You see where Brian's head is right there. It, it, there's just something. Watch Brian's head right at the ball. It starts. It starts pulling out a little bit. And everybody says, you know, just keep your head on the ball, keep your head down. It's almost a, that, that's almost a symptom rather than the cause. When you, when you start pulling out a little bit early, your head kind of goes with it. it. It looks like you're really pulling your head first, but you're not. First pitch to Grossman upstairs. Ball one. I don't know what it is about changing the number, uh, Dick. I, I really don't. I just in all the years that I, I played and watched, it always felt, especially when I played, you could just feel it. when we were on the other side of it, when we got down by a, a certain number. But all of a sudden, our guys started uh, throwing zeros up there, and the other team wasn't scoring any runs. Oh, nice catch by Blyer. Ball was headed up the middle. Twins strand two. Twins don't change the number. It's still 6-4. Casino story of the game. The Twins up a pair. Mark Trumbull got the Orioles on the board first with a two-run home run to straightaway center field. But the Twins would come back with bases loaded. Sano with a great at bat line drive single drove in the first run. Another great at bat by Kepler drove in uh, two more. That would make it three to two. And Eduardo Escobar would get a low change up and rock at this ball. Off the angle of the scoreboard in right center, he would drive in two and end up with a triple. Twins will take a six to two lead. The Orioles have scored two more since, but we're into the top of the seventh inning. The Twins are still up six to four with Tyler Duffy on the mound now for the Twins. Tyler Duffy needs a good out in the last couple, uh, in fact, the last three outings. He's given up at least a single run. Last three outings, three innings, and six earned runs allowed by Duffy. And he delivers strike one to Seth Smith. Manny Machado and Jonathan Scope will follow. One strike to Smith. Over three on the night. Fouled off a leg. Working with Jack Morris of Baltimore, and I wondered aloud why this guy's name is so hard to pronounce. It's two syllables. Seth Smith. So 0 and 2 here on Seth Smith and uh, Tyler Duffy. I've always I've always felt like 
pitchers when they get to 0 and 2 or even 1 and 2 should now think about all right where do I want to get this hitter out two pitches from now and then I'm going to go to the complete opposite of that. So he's got two for for me if he wants to get him out with a breaking ball for example down at that back foot then I think he needs to come in hard with a fastball or else I'm just off the plate outside to come back with it. Here he's going to come right to the breaking ball to try to get to the back foot. Almost did it. Smith almost swung at a pitch that might have hit him. Two strikes. I'd really like to see him come in here now. Just come in hard. It looks like they're going to go away. I like that. See, I don't I, with the with the strikeout pitch being the one down and in. I don't think that pitch does much. I don't think that impresses a hitter. He just okay. He missed away. I'm still worried about that ball coming down and in. And if I'm worried about the ball coming down and in, the fastball in is going to be a real my real nemesis. One and two. So here it comes down and in. If you little change up there. But for me now he's let he's let Smith back in the count just a little bit. I'm feeling a little bit better if I'm if I'm a left hand hitter right. I'm feeling a little bit better two and zero because I've seen all his pitches and he hasn't really impressed me inside yet. So I'm seeing the ball pretty well. And I Smith have draped over the plate. His arms are over the strike zone. Fortunately, uh, Tyler's got a really good breaking ball so far. At least in this at bat, he's thrown. Three of them in real good spots, and Seth Smith's just doing the best he possibly can to get a, get a piece of it. But he, when, you, when a left-handed hitter like is hitting over the top of a of a ball down in like that, you know the ball's breaking at the angle that uh, the pitcher wants it to be. Another two-two from Duffy. Far off over by the tarp. That pitch there helped a little bit more. Got a good high fastball that uh, Smith was uh, behind. Now, unless Smith is re is willing to be continue to be behind, he's got to be thinking about being a little bit more in a hurry, and that's why that breaking ball is a little bit more effective. The breaking ball flip foul over the tarp again. Ninth pitch of this at bat. He's still trying to get the first out of the inning. The starters have done a good job. Going seven, six, and two thirds, and in the case of last night, Urban Santana going nine. And with the All Star break coming up, it's all hands on deck for this four game series. Two and two. Grounded to Sano. Finally, Seth Smith is retired. One down. That'll bring up Machado, one for three in the ball game. Machado with a bouncer to third in the first, a single in the third, and as far as third base, and then he popped up to Polanco. Indians beat the Padres 11 to 2, the final score. Josh Tomlin getting the win. Machado swings at that fastball, fouls it straight back. Yeah, had a pretty good swing there. He was looking for a fastball and got it and just fouled it back. And probably the reason why he's hit 217, he's just he's just missed too many pitches this year. But it's also an indication of how Tyler Duffy has got to pit. He's got to get strike one, but he's got to get strike one with something else other than a fastball down the middle. And that, that's what's that's what's hurting him to this point. Oh, strike and it's 0-2. He's got that really good curveball, and he can throw the curveball for strike one if he wants to, which I think is a good pitch. But he also wants to impress guys with a fastball so that his curveball looks better. 
What's hurt him is when he tries to impress guys with a fastball and get ahead, too much of the time it's been right down the middle. He doesn't have enough fastball for that. Did he go? No, so his first base umpire, Jim Reynolds. Boy, that was a terrific pitch, though. It really was. He, he threw it right where he wanted to, over to. Oh, I would call that a strike. Yeah. One and two. Deep down the right field line, but foul. Duffy took the loss two outings ago in the first game of the doubleheader. That was the game started by Barrios at the 5 1 lead. Royals tied it up. Twins went to the bullpen and then they pounced on Duffy. And got three runs on four hits in one inning. One and two to Machado. Two and two. Pretty good job right there for taking those two breaking balls with two strikes, the 0 and 2 and the 1 and 2 there by Machado. That's those are good pitches. Duffy just missed the, missed the corner, but they were also I don't know how he did laid off of them. Yeah, I finally finally got it with another really good one, and, and Machado couldn't just couldn't lay off that one. I don't see how he laid off the other two. Fox tracks presented by Carrier. Yeah, he pressed him with a fastball. And then just kept burying that curveball right down there on the outside corner until Machado just got anxious. And when you see a hitter do that after taking a couple, he was he was protecting with two strikes, and then something got in his brain and said, "Okay, he's going to throw me a fastball in," and he jumped out there a little bit early, and that's what made him swing at that at that breaking ball. Two down, and now scope, and a strike over the inside corner with a changeup. The first pitch changeup to the right-handed batter. It was exactly that. Scope going to the All Star game. It'll be his first. It'll be the only Baltimore representative. One and one. Center field quickly. Two out single from Scope. That'll bring up Jones. Stands in or will as the tying run. July 18th is St. John's University College of St. Benedict's night at Target Field. A limited number of CSB SJU themed night ticket packages are available that include a game ticket and a red and white twins cap. Learn more at twinsbaseball.com slash CSB SJU. Great promotion the Twins have done the last few years with so many great colleges and universities in our area getting a tribute night here at the ballpark. Adam Jones reached on an air, was hit by a pitch, and singled. Off the plate, ball one. Getting six innings from their starter, asking Duffy to get the outs in the seventh. Maybe Taylor Rogers in the eighth. Kinsler in the ninth. Hit hard on the ground and through the hole. Duffy's having a hard time getting the third out of the seventh. And now he's got to face powerful Mark Trumbo. A couple of two out hits, and the Orioles are threatening. Well, I just left this breaking ball up, and he's lucky that that ball stayed uh, on the ground and in the ballpark. That's a uh, that's an Adam Jones home run pitch right there. Pulled it through the hole, and, and this is kind of, uh, in in my view, a little a little bit typical of, of Tyler Duffy. He's sailing along. He's got good stuff. He's throwing a really good curveball, and then all of a sudden he's one and one on scope and throws a foul. You saw this. The, Castro, the catcher, won an outside corner fastball. He threw it right down the middle, and Scope gets the single to center. And now he's now he's he doesn't trust his stuff as much. And they, then he throws now he throws a curveball that misses badly, where he'd been throwing really good ones. And 
and that was see since he missed it badly then he hung one and now he's in trouble. Ball one to Trumbo. Swung on a 3 0 pitch in the second inning and hit a home run to straightaway center field. That gave the Orioles an early 2 0 lead. It's got six runs in the third, haven't scored since, and the Orioles have been trimming the lead back now to just two. It's a check swing, but a call strike. Yeah, there he got his good curveball back. It just sometimes it seems like with, with some guys, they. They lose their feel a little bit and they make a couple of bad pitches and then it takes them a while to get it back. They start feeling for it a little bit instead of being the aggressive pitcher that they were in this case for the first two outs. So all somebody gets a hit and all of a sudden they're, they're struggling a little bit. One and one. Funny looking swing on a slower breaking yeah. ball. It took a little bit off the curve. When Tyler Duffy had his really, really good year two years ago, the thing that I was most impressed with was that he was throwing two speeds and trajectories of curveball. And that's really hard on a on a hitter. And I I felt like last year and, and even at times this year, curveball stayed pretty has stayed pretty much the same. And hitters have adjusted to it a little bit. One and two to Trumbo. By Castro, that ball kicks away. Tying runners in scoring position. Duffy throwing trouble, a lot of breaking balls here. And the count's even 2 2. And that's what I was talking about there with the 1 and 2 count. If he, I just felt like if, if Tyler could have the, the confidence to throw a fastball in 1 and 2 and press Trumbull inside, go to 2 and 2 and throw a breaking ball, then he's, then he's got it. Tapper foul. Another breaking ball. Just, just not quite down enough. Not bad, but not quite down enough. Jones is the tying runner. The Orioles putting together another threat here in the seventh after the second out. Popped up right side. Sano over for a look. And on the roof of the dugout, Sano takes a couple of steps into the dugout. So close to being a catchable ball and a big third out. Now Trumbo has another swing. Well, he showed him the fastball there. It was a pretty good fastball. Trumbled a little bit behind it. I don't think there's any question if he can throw that breaking ball on that outside part of the plate again, like he got uh, Machado, he's going to get trouble here. Yep. What a take. I don't know how he took it. What a take by Trumbull. Now the count is full and the runners will take off. That's the thing. I mean, Duffy to a veteran hitter, he's thrown everything he's got at him already. Yeah, that, that's a great try right there. Ooh. Right on the corner. Yeah, too. That, it could have been called a strike. I think you come back with the same one. Don't give in to him here. Throw that same pitch. I don't think he'll I don't think he'll take it again. Throw it again. And you got it. You have got to be aggressive with this. You can't you you can't kind of chicken out and leave it leave it in the plate leave it in the middle of the plate because you have to throw a strike you don't necessarily have to throw a strike here you have to throw a really good curveball be aggressive and throw it out there on the corner again ball four fastball low and now they're loaded up for Trey Mancini Cini, who has clubbed a couple of doubles and scored a couple of runs to lead the Oriole comeback. Neil Allen to the mound just to give Duffy a break. He's thrown 28 pitches and has seen the Orioles fill the bases after the second out. Both doubles were pulled into the left field corner. And if it weren't for the likes of Judge, Ben Attendi, three or four other really good rookies, we'd all be talking about Trey Mancini getting over 300 with power.
he has a real, really solid uh, hitting mechanic at the plate. He gets the big end of the bat to the ball very directly. Matt Davidson of the White Sox, Ben Gamble of the Mariners, Guriel of the Astros. A lot of great rookies. Now Duffy will try to get this guy out with the tying run at second base. The go ahead, run it first. Breaking ball, pounded foul. And CD has to play first base because Chris Davis is out with an oblique injury. Usually he's in left field. Boy, that's a little bit too good a swing on a first pitch breaking ball there. I think I I think they've got to they've got to come in with a fastball here, throw it hard in, off the off the plate, inside corner or off the plate. Because you want to get him out with a breaking ball, you got to show him something here. Bouncer to short. Nice. Polanco nice sets and ends the inning. Second inning tonight. But the Orioles have left the bases loaded without scoring. About it. The Orioles loaded the bases, but he got the third out without any damage done. And let's check uh, some other uh, notes around baseball. And the Rays just keep coming up with good pitching. And they beat the Red Sox 4 to 1. And the Brewers keep winning. They throttled the Cubs 11 to 2. Annabelle Sanchez has done a really nice job since they recalled him from their Triple A team in Toledo. His first win in nearly a year, and the Tigers beat the Giants. Michael Gibbons will pitch for the Orioles, and the first man he'll face, Miguel Sano. Michael Gibbons, really, really good out of the Orioles bullpen this year. A sidearm slinger. Good ERA, good opponent's batting average. Funky delivery. Big swing and a miss. Strike one. So he has a fastball from that delivery. You saw a little cutter, a, a short slider uh, right there from that sidearm sling delivery. And this fastball will run the other way in on right hand hitters. That makes it makes it tough. Well, straight fastball at 97. So does, another swing and a miss. So does 97. Yeah. Make it tough. 0 oh 2, Sano with two strikeouts on an RBI single and a run score. Half swing, strike three. So the strikeouts continue to mount for Sano. One down on the seventh. And that'll bring up Kepler. Well, I just threw this ball by him. It's a high fastball that he couldn't lay off of. 
and you just don't see a sidearm slinging uh, delivery like that where the ball rides it as much as usually it's a if somebody throws from the side like that's going to sink down and in that ball just kept riding high. Kepler takes an off speed pitch over strike one. Kepler with a two run single. It took the score from two to one Baltimore to three two twins. It's back in the six run third inning. Swing and a miss and it's own two. Very impressive by Gibbons so far. 97 mile an hour fastballs, two of them to Sano plus an 88 mile an hour cutter, a little, a little hard slider. Now two changeups. So we got a relief pitcher coming in with three so far, really plus pitches. Given six wins out of the Baltimore bullpen. The Orioles have fallen like a rock since the Twins saw them in Baltimore in May because they have been giving up runs at an incredible pace. As to the backstop, the Orioles in June. Had 19 games in a row where they gave up five or more runs. 19. Somehow they managed to win six of them. But there was a 16, there was a 14, another 16, a 15. I mean, it was just terrible. The pop up left side, and it should be an easy catch for Machado. Kepler retired two down. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Minnesota Twins LLC. It has to wear on your hitters when night after night you start a ball game and say we we got to score at least six to have a chance of winning a ball game. Yeah, it is. It is wearing. I played on some uh, some teams in the late 70s with the Twins. And we had really good hitting teams, and we had to be. We would play the White Sox. White Sox had a team similar to us in '77 and '78, and we'd play a lot of 11 to 9 games. I would explain that 19 to 12 game when we talked about with right. the Rod Carew right. going exactly over right. 400, foul back in its own too. You, Taylor Rogers up. Looks like he'll have the uh, the eighth inning, which is kind of per recipe here. Duffy seventh. Taylor Rogers eighth and Kinsler ninth if all goes according to plan for Paul Molitor. Two strikes to Escobar. Single and a two run triple and a run score. And Escobar strikes out. That's a one two three seven for Gibbons. You're watching Twins Baseball presented by State Farm.
everybody, I'm Jeff Grayson with your Mall of America Studio Sports Update. Let's go back a decade on the diamond. On this date 10 years ago, Justin Morneau became the fourth twin to hit three home runs in a single game. He did it in the second game of a doubleheader in Chicago against the White Sox. It was the first time that happened since 1973 with Tony Oliva. Since then, it's become a fairly common occurrence. Max Kepler did it in Cleveland last year. Brian Dozier did it here at Target Field. Eddie Rosario did it here earlier this year. Taylor Rogers comes in to pitch to the Orioles in the eighth. Taylor Rogers has done a really, really nice job of working his way into late inning relief specialist for uh, Paul Mulder and you have mentioned it several times uh, Dick, uh, on broadcast and the biggest biggest difference in change for Taylor Rogers is a much better ability to get right hand hitters out. And he'll face Wellington Castillo. And he's going to see some right hand. Yep. And again I asked Taylor the other day what are you doing differently and he said nothing I'm just you know having better success. Well. He is doing something differently, as evidenced by that fastball right there. He's throwing fastballs to right handers right hand hitters at better, better spots. He's got that great curveball that we just saw right there. But he's able to work both corners with his against right handers with his fastball much better this year. He can say if he wants, he can say he's not doing anything different, but the fastball location has been way, way better. Just like oh man, you see he had him. Castillo just got a piece of it, but there was fastball on the outside corner, good breaking ball, fastball on the inside corner. Just about put Castillo away pretty easily. With it. It's all about location. In the final game of the three game sweep in Baltimore, Rodgers had what might have been a very significant inning for him. He gave up a leadoff hit. To Joey Rickard. And he ended up getting, striking out Adam Jones, Manny Machado. Trumbo hit a ground ball to Brian Dozier that should have ended the inning. But Dozier made an error, and Rodgers had to face Chris Davis. And the game was 4 3 twins at the time. And he ended up striking Davis, and it was a great matchup, a great at bat, one of the Best at bats of the year. Here's a little flare to left. Off the end of the glove of Polanco. And Wellington Castillo gets a base hit to start the eighth. Take a look at the ball and Polanco going back and almost making the catch. Just off the top of his glove and went as far as he could as quickly as he could just couldn't quite get there. Rickard now will hit for Kim. And it was Rickard who started that inning with a base hit in Baltimore. And now Rickard represents the tying run. Fastball stuck on the outside corner. I remember that at bat against Chris Davis in Baltimore very, very well. He absolutely locked him up with a three and two breaking ball. And Chris Davis had absolutely no inkling that he would have the courage to throw him a three and two breaking ball there, and he threw it great. If he could, I think Chris Jimenez would have done handsprings back to the dugout. But Rogers was pumped up, but it was really the, the retiring the veteran right handed batters, and really he should have gotten all three. Uh, of the batters Trumbo Jones and Machado but he ended up having to face Davis and got him the Twins won the ball game by a run. One and one to Rickard. Two and one. And I think the reason I think you're right that it was a it, it was a big situation in the maturation of Taylor Rogers because it was gut check time there's no question about it the game was on the line he was facing a guy that hits hit 50 home runs veteran hitter and, and, and dangerous hitter and Chris Davis and he won that battle every time a young guy goes through that bouncer to short one and that's all they'll get 
think Malapa had a tough time getting the ball out of his glove. I don't think they would have gotten two anyway because Rickard is on the team in part because of his speed. One down. Well, Dick's right. He, he uh, catches the ball cleanly and then doesn't get it out of his glove as efficiently as he wanted to. But Dick's also right that I, I don't believe it would have made a difference. Rickard gets down the line. And when a guy hits the ball off the end of the bat like that, a right hander, he's, he's kind of, his weight is moving that direction a little bit. So he gets out of the box a little bit quicker, a little, little bit more quickly. Johnny Giavatella just added to the Oriole roster. Will pinch hit here in the eighth. And again, Rogers starts him with an off speed pitch, but strike one. You've seen a lot of Giavatella with the Royals, of course. One strike with Rickard at first and one down. Ball and another swing and a miss. Gentry in the on deck circle. He's going to hit for Seth Smith. Marshall Walter throwing the Oriole bench at Rogers here in the eighth inning. One and two. It's a good try by uh, Taylor Rogers right there. 95 mile an hour fastball just off the corner. If he could have hit the corner, he, he would have had him. But it also is a pretty good purpose pitch. Not, not bad at all. Over two. Yeah. Got him over the yeah. inside corner. Missed you know, the outside corner, so we got the inside. Right. Corner. You know, and I don't think he meant to throw it there, or at least the catcher didn't. Uh, Castro didn't mean to throw it, throw it there, but I think that was a better pitch. Two curveballs, and then 95 on the outside corner, and then just lock him up on the inside corner. I, I, I love that pitch right there. Castro didn't want it there, but well, I think that's a good pitch for after that sequence. Two down now. And Gentry hitting for Smith. And another breaking ball that shaves the outside corner. Gentry threatening to bunt. He's not doing anything different. <laughs> I'm just telling you <laughs> what he said. <laughs> oh, and two. Just off the outside corner, and he almost got a full swing. Up catcher Caleb Joseph is available. Orioles sending out starting pitchers to add bench players in advance of the All Star break. One and two. And now two and two. The Orioles have put together scoring threats in just about every inning here tonight. He's getting men on base. Rios had a one, two, three first inning, but he threw what, 19 pitches, 20 pitches at the inning. Drilled to center. Buxton coming in to end the inning. A very well hit ball for the third out. Rogers has a scoreless aim.
two run lead here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Stay with us after the game for Twins Live presented by Century Link. The Twins trailed early in this first, first in this one. We'll take a look at how they answered right back with a strong, explosive third inning. We'll also take a look at Byron Buxton, another multi-hit performance from him. We'll take a look at the mechanics and those adjustments that he's made and what's worked so well for him at the plate. And as always, we'll bring you the thoughts from manager Paul Molitor. That's all coming your way on Twins Live right after the game. Guys. All right. Thank you, Andre. Twins trying to win the opener here. As Roy says, it's important for the Twins to win this series and start building some home field advantage with the, which they have not built this year. Donnie Hart Hart a Slinging left-hander will come in to pitch to the Twins here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Sario, Polanco, and Castro will face him. Yep, you see the numbers on uh, on Hart. There. I, I have not uh, seen Donnie Hart, yet, so uh, I'm interested to see the slinging nature of this left-hander. Oh, I guess so. And Rosario tried to bunt, but missed strike one. Well, there are a lot of pinch hitters, so there are a lot of guys going different places <laughs> for the Orioles. Gentry ran out to left. Rickard ran out to right. And Giavatella is at second scope, moving over to short. Inside and Rosario taps it. Foul. Rosario drew a walk in the six run third inning. So yeah, the you're, the, you're the left hand. You're the left-handed hitter here, and where's that ball coming from? That's, you know, I started switch hitting when I was 14. Nobody like pitched like that it, when you at that age. But by the time I got to a, uh, by the time I got to a level of baseball where guys started pitching like that, boy, was I glad I was. Yeah, a I'll bet. Two strikes to Rosario. Dropped by Mancini, but he's able to make the play one down. Twins fans, if you can't catch the games on TV, you can stream them live on your mobile device. With Fox Sports Go, download the app, take Fox Sports North and Twins Baseball with you wherever you go. Switch hitter Polanco will take his swings right handed. Batting average to left handed batters than righties. Lefties hitting 278 against him. Yeah, the, it's a double edged sword because uh, it really looks like it, he should, uh, right, it should be a lot easier for right handers. The guy lays the ball out there with his delivery like that, you ought, to, you ought to be able to see it really, really well. Off the plate, 2 0. Oh. Polanco beat out a potential double play grounder, reaching in a fielder's choice in the six run third inning. Got credit for a run batted in because of that. It was a big run. That was the sixth run, if I recall, yep. in the yep. game. And it's Launched to right field. Rickard coming in, making the catch with Giamatella in the vicinity. Two down. MLB.TV Premium is back and better than ever. You can watch every out of market regular season game live on over 400 supported devices. Plus, get a free subscription to At Bat Premium. For one app for live baseball, blackout and other restrictions apply. Visit MLB.TV for details. There's Castro hit by a pitch that triggered the six run inning. Ended the inning by lining out to left and added a single in the sixth.
Castro with another hit. I got to tell you, Jason Castro has such a nice approach against left-handed uh, pitchers. That it's the second second hit against a left-hander uh, tonight, and we have seen him consistently just go to left field time after time, and not try to pull those lefties. He's he's really had some good professional at bats and driven a lot of runs against left-handed pitching. Buxton won't have a chance to hit against Hart. We've got a pitching change with Byron Bru uh, Buxton looking for his third hit of the night. Buxton, Twins leading six to four. Time now for Cricket something to smile about. And Byron Buxton with another multi hit game here tonight. Well, working very, very hard, changing his mechanics at this level, almost an impossible thing to do, but he's got tremendous talent and he's on the road. He looks like he's uh, he's got something he can start believing in. And it's not going to be perfect all the time, but the process is the process and it is going to work. It. At some point in time, he will get a chance to hit against the Sidewinder, just a right handed Sidewinder. <laughs> right. There are no day. This will put his uh, approach to the test. It's, <laughs> it, it really will. I mean, it, when you're facing a Sidewinder, it's, it's hard not to start pulling out of there a little bit early. Sidewinder from the same side. Breaking ball and a foul back. That was a, that was a pretty good swing, though. He's raised his average 17 points. Still a modest 215. 0 oh and 2. And another fastball. Got a foul tip. And Castro's left at first. It'll be a two run lead. Brandon Kinsler in the night.
Brandon Kinsler trying to pick up his 23rd save and would pull him into a tie with Craig Kimbrell for the American League lead in saves. Elson at first base delivered a run producing hit scored a run when the Twins got all their runs in the third inning. And Eduardo Escobar with a two run triple that inning. Kepler with a two run single so it's set up for Kinsler trying to pick up a save against the Orioles he'll have to face some veteran hitters in Machado scope and Jones. Well, Brandon Kinsler one of the main reasons why the twins are where they are this year as opposed to last year so many blown saves out of the bullpen to start the first half of the season last year and he's been at 88 percent you see that 22 for 25 that's uh, 88 percent is uh, it's about about as good as you can hope for and he's done a terrific job see if he can close this one. Machado one for four so far on the night. Strike one. That's the pitch that that slider right there that Kinsler's been working on it. That's a oops pitch right there that he got away with but. If he can get that ball down and have confidence in that pitch, that's really going to be a big one for him. Just off the outside corner. A little better there. That slider has the same kind of biting move, uh, a similar kind of bite to the slider as a sinker does. He throws some hard sink. And guys get that hard sinker, especially right handers, get that in their mind. That slider can be a real effective pitch. But he's gotten by on a hard sinker for. Almost exclusively for a while now. There it is. See that ball bore in on the right hand hitters? That's nasty. You don't think that doesn't impress hitters right there. They don't want that ball in there on the <laughs> that that looks like uh, coming up to right hand hitter, that looks like just above the thumbs kind of stuff. Alex Colomay with Tampa Bay's win got a save tonight. So he and Kimbrell right now share the lead. Two and one to Machado. To right, right at Kepler. And down. That pitch right there, the, the four seam fastball. And I was talking uh, with uh, Kinsler on the road when I was with the club in Chicago and Cleveland. We were talking in Cleveland, and he's been such a sinker ball pitcher. And all of a sudden, he started throwing the high riding uh, fastball to guys that were low ball hitters. And I said, Where'd that come, up, come from? He said, Oh, I've always been a four seam guy. I, I taught myself the sinker in independent baseball. So if he can come up with two fastballs and that slider, that's pretty devastating stuff. Scope the batter. He has two singles. I don't know how realistic it is. I still have some hope that Kitzler will be going to the All-Star game. There are some pitchers who will back away from the assignment to go to the All-Star game. Dylan Batanzas might have other things on his mind. He's having a hard time throwing strikes. And if it opens the door for someone else, perhaps Kinsler, maybe that's a good thing. Just missing the outside corner, one and one. That was the four seamer there. So he started with that little cutter, hard slider, and then he goes, tries for the corner with with uh, the four seam fastball, 95 miles an hour, and he can throw it up there, 92, 93, with that hard sink. That's why it makes it so difficult, especially on right handers. Two what? 95 with movement just missed. Jones on deck. Kinsler saved one of the three wins in Baltimore. First, Irvin Santana pitched a shutout in one of the twin twins. The other game was a kind of a blowout win for Minnesota. Kinsler saved the series finale. Doink behind first, and it'll fall for a hit. And Scope has his third hit of the night. Now Jones will come up and represents the tying run, and he has Kinsler in his book. He hit a home run against him last year. I can't imagine anything that would frustrate a pitcher more than to bury this ball in on a guy's fist like that and basically win the battle. And Guy end up on first base. That's about as weak as you can hit a ball. 
Jones tonight has reached all four times once on an air once by being hit by a pitch and a pair of singles. And missing the outside corner with 95 miles per hour. Strike people out, but he's known as a pitch to contact closer with most of the contact beaten into the ground. Right, pitched a very weak contact. A la scope the last time up. Why foul? That's one and one. And the Orioles figuratively, maybe even literally, limping into the Twin Cities after a tough stretch of games. They have kept after it here tonight. They have put men on base and have threatened all night long to get this game tied up. One and one. Two and one. The trade off for Kinsler, absent the high number of strikeouts, is the low number of walks. Just eight of them. One of those intentional. And I have to tell you, if I could, if I had to pick one or the other, if I'm the manager and my closer head could have one or the other, I'd take fewer strikeouts and no walks. Oh man, just nasty. 96 and on, on the fist. Two and two. Watch this ball move, just run hard in there. So he's got a lot of weapons now. He just he just impressed Adam Jones with uh, just a nasty running fastball at 96 in on his fist. He's got he's got the four seam fastball on the outside corner. He's got the sinker on the outside corner. And he's got his slider. All three can be effective now back outside. Two and two to Jones. Full count, Trumbo on deck. There are some times in a, in a bat where the count is such that has the at bat has gone. It, if you can just throw the strike where you want to throw it, you've got the hitter. And if not, you let him back in the count. And that was one of those cases. A two and two right there. He had Adam Jones on the outside corner and just could not could not get it there. Now he's going to have to make a really really good pitch. Oh, Jam man. shot. Kinsler bare hands looks at second throws to first. <laughs> and Jones runs down the line a little bit to give his thumbs a chance to heal. <laughs> Two down that'll bring up Trumbo. Kevin Gosman a disappointing year for the Orioles. He'll go for Baltimore tomorrow. And Felix Jorge is going to make his uh, second start for the Twins. He was sent back to Rochester. After the doubleheader in Kansas City, Hector Santiago put on the disabled list, and Jorge will make his second big league start, hoping simply to do what he did in his first big you league bet. start. Big Mark Trumbo, who homered to center in the second inning, last hope for the Orioles. Strike one. What Trumbo did to put the Orioles up early, two to nothing. Well, he got a bit of a cookie. He got uh, ahead three and all. Got the the hit sign from uh, Buck Showalter and uh, got a fastball right down the middle. That's that's uh, a gift for uh, for Trumbo. He can hit him, but the, I'm telling you, the way that Kinsler's pitching with his stuff right now, if he just stays out of the middle of the plate, he's going to get he's going to get Trumbo. His stuff is moving all over the place. One just stay out of the middle. Oh. High chopper over the mound. Charged by Dozier. Scoops, fires, got him. And the Twins have won all four against the Orioles so far this year. Well, that's a complete ball game by this uh, ball club. They got a, a uh, battling six innings out of their starter. Those outfielders had a real good game at the plate, as did the big man. And the bullpen did the job in the seventh eighth and then Kinsler was na as nasty as stuff as he's had this year 
just absolutely pummeled the uh, Orioles in the ninth inning for the win and the save. Tom, the Twins are hoping to build some momentum going into the All-Star break, and a nail-biting win over the Orioles should help in that regard. Dick, the Twins turned up the heat tonight on Baltimore in a homestand that they've hit over 300 and averaged five runs a game. Up next on Twins Live, presented by CenturyLink. We'll talk about the bats coming out in the third for Minnesota, and here from Paul Molitor.